And this is the second part of our overview for gastronomy. And I will start with the omnivore's paradox. So we all know that we humans are omnivorous, meaning we consume both plants and animal products. And the advantage of being omnivorous is that we can adapt to almost any environment, meaning we can consume a lot of different types of food uh, in most of the places. But the, dis but the disadvantage is there is no single food that will provide us with our nutrition. So we have to consume a little bit of everything to have our complete nutrition on a daily basis and we are that flexible enough to eat a variety of items sufficient for our physical growth but always remember that we also have to be cautious enough not to randomly ingest foods which are harmful or possibly fatal to us. Now the need to experiment combined with the need for conservatism is what we call the omnivore's paradox. And we also associate food with self-identity. The choice of the foods that we ingest is usually psychological in nature or what we call the incorporation of food. For many people, when you say incorporation of food, it's not only the physical uh, aspect but also more of associative aspect, which means what you consume or what you eat is who you are. So that is a popular saying, you are what you eat. And the correlation between what people eat and how others perceive them is characterized by their philosophy, their beliefs, and sometimes their opinions of themselves. Food choice in, is in fact influenced by self-identity wherein the food likes or dislikes of someone else are accepted and internalized as personal preferences. But when usually when we are open to trying out different cuisines and as we grow older, we get to meet different people, we explore different places, we travel to different countries or regions, and we feel that our taste buds are open to trying out different kinds of flavor. That is usually the first step of trying to be more open with the food choices that you have. But if you will be sticking to your identity, for example, as someone who just eats meat, then you will have lesser choices. And when you go to different places, you will have lesser food to consume. And that is for self-identity. We also associate food with symbols. Like in the Bible, bread is heavily associated with the body of Christ in the Christian sacrament of communion. And in other places, bread traditionally was eaten by the poor and the rich. It just depends whether you're eating a white bread or a dark bread. And in many cultures, bread is shared by couples as part of the wedding ceremony or left for the soul of the dead. And in Greece, soldiers took a piece from home to ensure their safe, victorious return. And sailors also traditionally brought bun to the sea to prevent shipwreck. And probably one of the most influential factors of our food preferences is culture. It is an essential symbolic function of food. And aside from this fact, what one eats define who one is. Culturally speaking, uh, let's say you are in the Middle East. Of course, we know that Majority of the people in the Middle East are Muslims, so it is always assumed that when you get to know a person who does not eat pork, it somehow tells you that probably it is because of his religion. 
and also in Judaism, pork is prohibited. And let's say when you eat ravioli with roast turkey, you sort of combine two iconic dishes of two countries. Ravioli is famous in Italy and roast turkey is famous in the US. And then you combine it together, you can sort of tell whether the family is Italian or American. And then a Mexican-American family would more likely be dining on tamales and turkey instead of ravioli and turkey. So the association of cultural identity with food is so varied and so diverse, which is why we have what we call the fusion cuisine nowadays, wherein two separate cuisines are being merged as one. And the food habits of each cultural group are also often linked to religious beliefs or ethnic behavior. And eating is like a daily reaffirmation of cultural identity. The appropriate use of food with behavior associated with eating is what we call etiquette. And another expression of group membership. In the U.S., manners are required when having lunch with business associates. Of course, if you have if you are having a business meeting, there are certain rules and etiquette that you will be following when having lunch with your uh, business associates. Let's say in, a, in an expensive restaurant, and when attending a tea, and when eating in a school cafeteria, or when you're drinking friends with bar, it follows with your manners or your etiquette. Alright, so here, I have included some dining etiquette found in some parts of the world and some are really surprising and some are somehow obvious already. In Japan, for those who have been to Japan or for those of you who are following videos about a cuisine of Japan, most commonly when you're eating noodles or soup, you usually show your appreciation to the chef by slurping. Because they say when you slurp loud enough for the chef to hear, that means you appreciate their cooking. Or it tells them that what they just cooked is delicious, which is why it shows on how loud you slurp the soup or the noodles. So in Japan, eating soup or noodles, the louder the slurp, the better. And chopsticks, of course, are very important in the Japanese culture. And they have a norm not to cross your chopsticks, not to lick your chopsticks, or stick your chop chopsticks in a bowl of rice. So that is against their custom. And in the Middle East, in India, and in some parts of Africa, it is unclean to eat with your left hand. So do you have an idea why in those countries mentioned, it is considered unsanitary to eat using your left hand? So if you have an idea, you can comment them. We might probably have the same thing in mind. And in France, Splitting the bill is considered the height of unsophistication. So when you go out to dine in France, it's either you pay for the whole bill or your friend or the other person will pay for it. So it's not a norm in France to do the what we call KKB or kanya-kanyang bayad na nakasanayan natin here in the Philippines. And then additional etiquette is that you are supposed to use two hands to eat, either fork and knife or fork or bread. Bread is usually used as uh, an assistant to the fork. When you try to scoop out a piece of uh, your food, you do it with the bread and then you lead it down to the fork and then it's the time that you can eat it. So it's not meant to be served as appetizer but instead it serves to assist the food to the fork. And when you eat bread, 
tear a piece of it and do not bite directly onto the bread. So that is one of uh, the etiquette that they do in France. And again, in China, belches are considered an indication that you are satisfied with the food that is being served. So burping or belching or making a mess around the table serves a similar purpose, meaning you are so excited to eat the food because you thought of it as something that's so delicious, which is why you burp and then you make a mess on the table. And when you leave a bit of leftover, it shows that the host uh, has served you or has provided you enough food so it's more preferable that you leave a bit of the food as a leftover in China. And then status is also related to cultural identity because when you say food symbolism and status, it tells about a person's position or ranking within a particular group. And food can be signified as an economic social standing, let's say, when you are eating champagne and caviar, it tells usually that you are a well-off person because it implies wealth. And when you eat beans or potatoes, traditionally, those foods are associated with the underprivileged. So that is what we call status food. And in general, eating with someone connotes social equality with that person. So it is it has become a norm in our society to dine in with different kinds of people. And usually that is where conversations and building relationships start. Culture is broadly defined as the values, beliefs, attitudes, practices accepted by a member's or by the members of a group or community. And culture is learned, not inherited. Which is why we always tell that culture is passed on from generations to generations through language acquisition, socialization, and that is what we call enculturation. And ethnicity is defined as the cultural membership. It is when people from one ethnicity move to an area with different cultural norm and then that person tries to adapt with the new majority of the society. And that is what we call the process of acculturation. So that is the difference. Enculturation and acculturation. And for this last slide that I'll be presenting, I would like to have a discussion so I will be leaving a discussion question. I would like you to describe your food habits or food preferences in two sentences. You will be making your comments on the video, on the comment section of the video. And you can cite one major factor that influence your choice of food. I have included some factors and those are your family's budget for food. So you can tell probably that because of your family budget for food, you are only limited to certain types of ingredients, usually the most affordable ingredients. Or you can also say that your food habits is uh, influenced by your religion or your culture, or sometimes the availability of ingredients in your area. Or it can also be, you can say that because my mom doesn't know how to cook other dishes, my mom only knows Ilocano food, which is why most of the foods that we are eating are Ilocano uh, cuisine. So that is also one factor. And also health reason is also an important factor. And I am excited to wait for your responses. All right. So have a good day, everyone, and see you again on the next video.